You are listening to the To and Out CFL Podcast, a proud member of the Canadian Football Podcast Network. Grab some poutine and a double-double. It's time for the To and Out CFL Podcast. He's got it! Oh, baby! Every week, Travis Cura. That's yeah. great company, which is a different person. And Brazilian Tide. Hunters are people, too. Talk fantasy football, bring you the latest in CFL news, and sprinkle in a little bit of nonsense. Oh, nearly intercepted it is! And it's over! Ready, set, hunt! <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of the Two and Out Podcast with Travis Curra and Sheldon Jones. Sheldon, what a day it's been. We were going to record this at 5.30 in the morning, (laughs) but I got back from Banff National Park between 11 and 12. I set my coffee to brew at 10 after 5. I set my alarm at 20 after 5. I was going to go downstairs and get my coffee, and I slept through everything. (laughs) Yep, you sure did. So here we are in the afternoon. I went to reheat my coffee in this stainless steel coffee pot on the stove. But the plastic, which I thought was raised enough. No, it uh, melted. (laughs) It's been a Monday, brother. (laughs) Case of the Mondays. Let's talk about week 16 in the Canadian Football League. It started with a doubleheader on Friday night. The Ottawa Red Blacks beating the Saskatchewan Rough Riders 36-28. Honestly, a score that probably uh, flatters the Riders a little bit. Not probably. Definitely. Yeah. At least we can get this out of the way first. (laughs) Uh, Frankie Hickson was running the ball really well early on. And actually, Sask was moving the ball really well early on and they opened up the scoring uh keen schaefer baker getting the first touchdown and if i look at frankie hickson stats he had 8.6 yards a carry the problem is he only got nine carries (laughs) yeah it's like jason moss came and started coaching again like what the (laughs) i don't understand i don't understand he was running the ball like You're still rattled. <laughs> I I am rattled, and I'm even more rattled that they scored the that touch there the touchdown at the end of the game. Like the return by Super Mario was cool, but like, where was that in the second right. half? Like, there was just no urgency from them at all after like the first. Co- well, I guess up until a minute left in the first half when we all saw what happened, but frustrating. <laughs> It, it it just looked like the Red Blacks came out with more intensity, more energy, more speed, yeah. more discipline. <laughs> like they, oh. they it, it does look like the Riders hit their emotional peak and their uh, intensity peak on Labor Day. And ever since then, it's just been gone. Although Ottawa getting helped by Saskatchewan penalties, the discipline rearing its ugly head against for the riders. Uh, They took a face masking, an unnecessary roughness, an illegal contact, all on one drive. The uh, first touchdown drive for the Red Blacks where Tyrell Pigram ran it in. So that was some flashbacks in 2022 as well. Yeah, it was just, it was ridiculous because they were playing very disciplined earlier on the season. Like that was like one of the few things that I think Rider Nation was kind of giving Craig Dickinson kudos for because he said he was going to work on the discipline and he did. But I, I think this team just, they beat BC, they beat Winnipeg, and then they thought that they're, they thought they were a good, good team all of a sudden. Like, I don't know what happened. Newsflash, you're the worst team in the league now. It's, it's not up for debate. You just got trounced by Ottawa. <laughs> like, before that, you got beat by Edmonton. This game against Calgary coming up in a couple weeks is for the worst team in the league. Sorry. (laughs) Which is actually quite surprising. You know, it's kind of funny because uh, the the Riders had an opportunity here there. But the the Riders, they they look like they're going to squeak into the playoffs. They're going to limp into these playoffs, which is... Which is, well, could there be a crossover mathematically? <laughs> Maybe mathematically. Uh, but... <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's, I don't think it's taken away like mathematically, but there would have to be some, 
a crazy finish for that to happen. But just this is the Riders are going to limp into the playoffs and they're going to somehow win the Western semifinal. <laughs> and then Craig Dickinson is going to get a lifetime contract and I'm going to be miserable for the rest of my life. <laughs> Uh, Jake Dolagala found uh, Samuel Emelis wide open. The Riders took a 13-7 lead with 13.45 left in the second quarter because Brett Lothar missed the point after. But uh, after that, that's when it kind of just fell apart for them, even though early on it seemed like the Riders, uh, their defensive line was getting to uh, Dustin Crum, even though there was uh, some injuries on the D line, Jake Dolagala didn't have his first incompletion until well into the second quarter. But then it was Brandon Dandridge who took a punt inside the Saskatchewan 20. The penalty called it back. And then the Red Blacks were running wild all over the Rough Riders. And the rush defense seems to have fallen apart again for the Riders. Credit, obviously, to Devontae Williams here. 136 yards on 22 carries, 6.2 yards a carry. I had him in my fantasy lineup, but I was I was so frustrated. He couldn't buy a touchdown. He got tackled yeah. at the one. There was another one where he was slightly overthrown at a, on a receiving touchdown. Uh, mm -hmm. But still, 136 yards in that rider defense. Another 53 from Dustin Crum. The uh, riders or the Red Blacks were running wild here. Yeah, well, the past two games have shown that's how you beat the Riders is by running over them. Seems like they, it, yeah. They can't stop the run. And now they're going to BC <laughs> against one of the top two mobile quarterbacks in the league, Vernon Adams, and Mizell, he had a good game. He did. <laughs> so the, it's just the thing that was really frustrating for me is yeah, Dola Gala looked good in the first half, but you could tell that the Ottawa defenders were biting on like he was locking in on his targets and they were they were jumping routes. There was a couple that were almost picked before that pick that happened, but I think that's that's coaching because Jeffries is down on the he's on the sideline. He's not up in the booth like most OCs usually are. And if he's up there, he may have been able to see that on that Emelis touchdown the defender was peeking back because they had established the run and mm. it was a play action. And then Emelis was wide open. Like why they went away from that. I have no idea. Uh, the Red Blacks actually could have beaten Saskatchewan a, a little bit worse. There was the flag that wiped off the big uh, Dandridge return. The first one, there was a yeah. flag that wiped off a big Devonte Williams screen play. But then it was at the end of the half where I think Ottawa took all the momentum away. They, they picked off Dola Gala. Uh, the Red Blacks took it over at the six. It was touchdown Braylon Addison. So they had a 16-13 lead. And then the Riders, they called a passing play at the end of the first half. Ottawa gets to him, forces a fumble, and then they've got another three points on the board. So <laughs> all yeah. at the end of the... Uh, half there all the momentum went Ottawa's way well I think like correct me if I'm wrong but I think the last time the Riders actually played in Ottawa Cody's first start I think one of his first few starts and near and right at the end of the the first half they had this huge drive to set up a field goal to go in with momentum I'm I'm fairly certain that's what happened so obviously that's what Dickinson was trying to do there but why just <laughs> Yeah. Just run the ball and, you know, you gave up a huge touchdown that you shouldn't have. Go into the half. You were getting the ball back to start the second half. Like, it just, when you force things, mistakes happen. And it, that's what happened here. There was a bit of a, a hot potato football a little bit there. Where <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> was Me it yelling at my TV? <laughs> Tevin Jones makes the catch, and then the Ottawa defender buries his helmet right into the ball. It flies oh. into the air. Uh, Red Blacks recover, <laughs> but then, uh, no, yeah, it was, yeah, the Riders forced a fumble, and mm -hmm. then the Tevin Jones uh, yeah. fumble happened. Yeah. So every time they got an opportunity, Ottawa took it right back. Yeah, I thought you were actually talking about when Dola Gala fumbled and the ball was just sitting oh. on the turf for like five seconds and nobody, nobody was... wants it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was losing my mind. <laughs> 
So it ends up uh, COC Mariner gets a 29-14 lead for the Red Blacks. Uh, Dustin Crum has an amazing touchdown run. And they were up on the Riders very, very well. And then at the end of the game, like, uh, I don't know, Saskatchewan somehow got into this game. Like, it was 35-14 Ottawa at one point. (laughs) And then the Riders, they get some... uh, touchdowns late in the game to make the uh the score a bit more flattering to them but uh this was really all ottawa really uh all game long and as soon as saskatchewan was forced into those passing situations when they were down three scores that's when the ottawa defense just feasted on uh, the Ryder o-line they they had philip blake back into the lineup and it seemed like it messed up the pass pro for the riders the yeah, ru- rush blocking seemed good mm-hmm. but uh maybe jake was hanging onto the ball a little too long but uh the rider or the red blacks uh d line <laughs> was able to just pin their ears back and get after the riders yeah and i i read just before we came on here uh that philip blake and godber both weren't practicing today so Ooh. great <laughs> yeah it, it does look like it's going to be a tumultuous end of the season for uh the riders here but hey five giveaways for them three fumbles two interceptions against uh ottawa's one giveaway and the riders had 11 penalties for 123 yards even uh derek moncrief kind of uh, uncharacteristic for him they moved him into the safety spot he was taking penalties uh, even though the red blacks had the ball for a full 10 minutes less than Saskatchewan. Uh, Dustin Crum, 21 of 27, 243 yards, two passing touchdowns, a rushing touchdown. That looked like an emotional high, an emotional win for that Ottawa team who still has playoff hopes. They're two games behind the Alouettes. That Alouette win over Calgary, absolutely massive for them. In, in so many ways, now it's going to be tough for Ottawa to catch them. If they lost to Calgary, there would be a little bit more hope for the Red Blacks right now. But uh, credit to Bob Dice, credit to Dustin Crum for uh, still being able to give a crap at this point of the season. I think it can be tough when you're six or seven games under 500 and still want to get out there and win football games. It helps that they were at home at TD Place, but... I. Good for the Red Blacks, man. They came out more physical, more emotional, more intensity, and (laughs) they punched the Riders in the face. Bottom line. Yeah, full marks to them. They were ready. The Riders were not. I I think they gave up after what happened in the at the end of the first. Like you could tell that seemed like it. Like they just they lost all the momentum and they got momentum back with a minute left when Super Mario had his touchdown. Like there was 28 minutes of game time yeah. that they just were flat and it seemed like they didn't care. And the thing that really pissed me off is it didn't really look like Dickinson cared that much either. He didn't look upset. I saw him him chewing out uh, Moncrief in the first quarter when he got his penalty, but like he just looked confused out there. It's like, why are we not playing good? We should be good. <laughs> like, no. And apparently the practices have been pretty lackadaisical and – they're collapsing at the end of the game. So obviously mm. conditioning's off. They're getting hurt. So there's there's a lot of issues with the riders. And we're going to have to wait till the end of the year for them to fix it, I guess. But it's just, that's not how you get fans to come back and buy in next year. That's not how you, like, I know we only have one home game left, but. You gotta you gotta give the reason the fans a reason to come out, right? It does look like, at least I think, there's going to be changes at the end of this season in Saskatchewan. Of course, they've got four games left. They could yeah. win four. Oh, and and they're they're going to be in the playoffs. So it's not like yeah. it's not like I'm writing them off, but I I don't want them to win. Like <laughs> then it sucks to hear that, but then change is not going to happen, right? So I just. Maybe they really want to draft uh, 
Mr. Rourke. I don't know. Like, Ooh, is that what they're Curtis really looking Rourke. to do? <laughs> I, I think that's a pipe dream, but maybe maybe they want that first pick. I don't know. Samuel Amelis was Saskatchewan's. No, Jarris Stearns was Saskatchewan's yeah. leading receiver, 72 yards. Oh, no, I'm wrong again. Keen <laughs> Schaefer Baker was Saskatchewan's <laughs> leading receiver. He had 76. Amelis had 63. Uh, let's, let's make sure I'm right on this statement. Jalen Acklin. Uh, was uh, Ottawa's leading receiver. He had 66 yards. And uh, Jake Dolagala, 25 of 36, 294 yards, two touchdowns, but two INTs. That does not uh, add up to a winning formula there. Let's go to the second half of the Friday night doubleheader where the BC Lions beat the Edmonton Elks 37-29. And as... A couple of these games took place. You kind of thought that maybe there would be some playoff races coming right down to the end, but the playoff picture is starting to get clearer. The cream of the CFL is rising to the top, and I think that's what the BC Lions did here in Edmonton. They were up 21-7 after the first quarter, Sheldon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just before we get into the game, I just want to point out, I think it's terrible that TSN is staggering these games and not... They have them on two different channels, and the times are like the second game is starting before the first game is over. Is if that you're a gonna CFL do that, or a TSN or a joint oh, decision? Who knows? Yeah, I don't know, but if you're gonna do that, at least because on my guide, at least it showed the second game starting for the full three hours after. So start the game from the from the beginning so that people watching the end of the first game can start it. That's my rant. Yeah, I uh, I'm not a fan of it, but then you get fans complaining. And I don't know if the 30 minutes makes a difference. People will complain about an 8 o'clock kickoff in the West or in the Mountain Time Zone and then complain about a 10 Eastern kickoff in Ontario. I, I don't know how yeah. you win, but... Uh, yeah, no, I get it. It's just yeah. it's just frustrating because I, I, a I lot of people like, like either, me, but... you know, suck at making sure that the right things, the right games are recording <laughs> and... Well, sometimes the guide's not right, so it's it's pretty tough to figure that out. Yeah. Uh, Justin McInnes getting the first touchdown on the board for the BC Lions. He's on absolute fire for the Red or the what am I doing? The Lions over the past couple games here, man. I, I thought they've been missing uh, number nineteen, Dominic Rhymes. I like that he's wearing the lucky whitehead uh, uh, hat on the sideline. He's been poking around practice, but Justin McKinnis gets the first touchdown. He only had two catches for twenty-two yards, but he makes his catches count. Uh, apparently, yeah. uh, lately, now it was seven-seven. Edmonton getting their first points of the season against the BC Lions in their third game against the BC Lions, and it was scored by the defense. <laughs> yeah. As, yeah, a pick six is always exciting. You always you love to see that. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. That gets the crowd going, even more than offensive touchdown. It's just, let's go. Uh, then Javon Katoy scores a touchdown. Like I said, I've said it Nobody before. wanted to tackle him. <laughs> no! no <one. laughs> he, he had 70 pounds on all the DBs, and they're like, nope, I'm, <laughs> I'm out. If you can run to the end zone, you yeah. can have it, brother. Yeah. <laughs> but that was hilarious. We got to give props, I think, to BC's game plan on defense. They were getting after Ford, and there yeah. were a couple times where I thought Trey was not... Uh, gonna get up and not because there were cheap shots but there was a point where there was a he had his ankle uh, rolled up under him and I'm like oh that didn't look good and he was in there for the next play late in the game it was an unnecessary shot that Trey ended up taking in the fourth quarter uh sliding <laughs> takes a shot but then but his teammate didn't help him out at all there like yeah you're you right think, after you that think you're standing up for him but no you're just throwing a guy into your own legs like old lineman mark cordy wants to stand up for trey ford pushes the lions defender he hits trey <laughs> slow i don't know i felt like sunday was probably a lot of time and saturday a lot of time in the tub for Trey yeah. Ford, uh, looked like he had a uh, a tough go in this one, but running overall was not good 
for the Edmonton Elks. Kevin Brown, six carries for 18 yards. He has been on fire. He did get banged up a little bit in this one. Uh, I think he ended up returning. Shannon Brooks getting a few carries, three for 22. So he did have success in his limited carries in this one. But the Elks rushing attack, supremely limited in this one. Even when you're able to hold Trey Ford to 43 yards, it seems like a big success for a defense. Oh, yeah, yeah uh, just BC seemed to be all over them. and uh, But just like the Riders, they had, Edmonton had their chance to come back and they made it... Yeah. Uh, they made it close in the end, and uh, which that's CFL football. We love to see it. Yeah, uh, you, no lead is safe. It's always <laughs> there's always that chance. So it's it was good. It, 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 I would have liked to see Edmonton get in there, but uh, you just feel for Trey when he was scrambling right at the end there and trying to make something work and gets just take it by his shoestrings and yeah, yeah. Eh, well, well, and we got a. Uh, give a shout out here to take one myself. The, the mm. lions have struggled run, running the ball themselves, but my I guess has success against the Edmonton Elks in, in this one, 16 carries 112 yards, two rushing touchdowns. He added four catches for 28 yards as well. I, I guess he just plays well against the Edmonton Elks. He had good games against them earlier this season as well. So that's big for the Lions. And the Elks rush defense has struggled uh, many times this season. This was a big one too because Vernon Adams Jr., he actually outrushed uh, Trey Ford. And I think it was the timing of uh, Vernon's runs. Like at the end of the game, uh, there was a second and 10 late in the fourth quarter and nobody's watching VA. He takes off for the first down, eating more of that precious clock as mm. the uh, Lions wanted to put the Elks away. So the, the defense for the Elks, they fought. They got a pick six. They had that in the first half. Darius Bratton basically just stole the ball. Yeah, <laughs> I think it was Justin McInnes. Mm -hmm. So they they were making plays, even uh, AC Leonard and his pregame hot dog. Like I thought, a guy like that, he's probably eating six hot dogs. But uh... <laughs> I would think he'd be eating nothing but chicken and rice. Like, yeah, you got to awesome. stay lean, man. So I, <laughs> yeah. I, it gives me hope when uh, guys are able to eat hot dogs and processed foods like that and still be uh, elite athletes. <laughs> I mean. We're not in the gym, you know, six hours a day after practice. So. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers with the super big gulp, baby. <laughs> so late in the first half, Dylan Mitchell did score a touchdown uh, for the Elks. So it took until 126 left in the second quarter of the third game for the Elks offense to finally score a touchdown on the Lions defense. So yeah. Trey Ford, he actually did okay passing the ball when he was able to get the ball away. 20 of 27, 182 yards and two touchdowns. No turnovers in that department, but getting sacked seven times. That will hurt anybody. I think, and uh, he, he's probably glad that he doesn't have to play. Uh, I think the Elks are off. No, yeah, they're off this week. So uh, he's uh, happy that they don't have to play uh, this week. Uh, yeah. Jake Ceresna had two sacks for the Edmonton Elks. And come on, a shout out to Dean Faithful here. He... he... <laughs> But he wasn't so, so faithful, was he? No, there were a couple misses there. And <laughs> if you look at the uh, at the way the score is, the Lions winning by eight, faithful missed a, uh, a field goal. Oh, he missed two field goals. So if those get converted, maybe some play calls need to be made a little bit differently. And then... Uh, the game's a little bit different, but it was at the end of the first half when <laughs> he kicks a field goal. <laughs> it's 24-17 Edmonton, and he, he sips the tea. Yeah, I, that's a sweet, Sully. Just, <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> very it's, very light, but I I liked it. It is. It is. So, so the Lions twenty four points in the in the first half. Like that's gonna yeah. uh, sink many many teams. They're mm. uh, the Elks did fight back though, and, uh, and uh, I guess that is Trey Ford magic. Kind of thought that hopefully or maybe there would be some fourth quarter magic again, but uh, the Elks were. Uh, or the Lions were able to hold on to this game. I got to give a shout out to Sean White. 35 seconds left in the game, kicks a field goal, crushing a Coke on the sidelines. My man. <laughs> Another thing that gives me hope. Yep. Now I'm running out of time <clears throat> to uh, be a rookie in the Canadian Football League, but. <laughs> And I don't think my 36? leg can, I, I don't know. <laughs> my range might be 18 yards as a field goal kicker. <laughs> but I'm willing to learn, and I'd like to think I'm coachable. <laughs> so uh, there's my uh, there's my resume. The, the Lions hanging on, clinching a playoff spot in this one. The leading receiver, Keon Hatcher, 91 yards on four catches. He did have a tough drop in the in this one though too. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a 57 yarder right after TSN talked about Keon Hatcher on the sideline firing up his offense to get him going, and then he makes the big play. I, I don't know, they're clairvoyance or something. It happens all the time. Like they'll they'll key in on a player, and then that player will just have a play. Like it's it's very very bizarre. It's sometimes. too much to be a coincidence, man. Oh. Like football is was scripted. A, oh, sometimes, <laughs> I mean, how's a defense going to put it or let seventy on them? Oh wait, it's the Broncos. Oh, that's why. Whoa, that's the tough. Denver Broncos. <laughs> Javon Katoy, four catches, eighty-eight yards, including a fifty-seven-yard touchdown, and uh, VA sixteen at twenty-six, two sixty-five, two picks, two touchdowns, but. Now it just seems like he's able to, you know, trust that his defense is going to yeah. back him up if he makes a mistake. And the responses that he has after those interceptions, those are uh, the mm -hmm. mark of, uh, I think, a player that's really growing into the role as a uh, starting quarterback for the BC Lions and a team that has a shot still at first place in the West. Leading receiver for the Edmonton Elks, Kyron Moore. Eight catches on nine targets. Uh, Swerve had 56 yards in this one. Dylan Mitchell had 42 yards, two touchdowns for him. Geno Lewis was uh, limited in this one. Two catches and 38 yards. But that 33-yard catch he made was an absolute beauty. So now the path to the playoffs for the Elks, it's, it's done. Uh, at least <laughs> it's it, it looks to be done. Uh, they do trail the Riders. So I think they would need to win out and have the Riders lose out to mathematically get in. Uh, yeah, because the Riders will still be up one game because of the tiebreaker too, right? So, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think that looks like their only way to get in. But mm -hmm. uh, there you go. Saturday had the Montreal Alouettes... <laughs> Beating the Calgary Stampeders 28-11. It was 11-8 at halftime for Montreal. And this, I thought, was a game that the Stampeders, obviously they needed to win, but they just didn't have it. Like on the first drive when Sean Lemon gets an interception, the most outstanding Defensive player nominee out of the West last year doesn't get signed and he stares down the Stampede sideline. I mean, at that ben, point, it just. <laughs> football is scripted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I don't know if you. I really thought that Montreal was offside on that play. Uh, number 35, I guess in technical terms, this will not be correct, was at the top of our TV screen on the line of scrimmage. He looked offside to me. That would have been Reggie uh, Stubblefield, I think. Yeah, well, and there's one thing that we kind of forgot to talk about in the Ryder game because on that one penalty that, like, Crum was – like, he went over the line of scrimmage and back and then threw the ball, I yeah, swear. Yeah, 
Yeah. Like, so, but so the a couple missed calls this week or this weekend. At least I thought he was. I, I, I don't know if anybody has really talked about that, but maybe he got back. I don't know, but, uh, Hey, the interception stood. And he uh, just snatched it out of it. Like he just snatched it out oh, too. Like it was, Oh yeah. it wasn't an easy one. He just, he, you could tell he was playing with that extra edge to say, screw you guys for not <laughs> signing me. And you love to see it. Like I've, I've never really been the biggest Sean Lemon fan, to be honest. Like maybe that's just because it never worked out in, in when we <laughs> signed him and he was supposed to be a big star. Did he have two stints? Well, he his first stint, yeah, he like with us, but then he was just an unknown player at that time. But yeah. then, yeah, when we signed him, like with that year was terrible. Capacotti, we thought <laughs> big things of him. Sean Lemon, like, but but Sean Lemon is he? Calgary should have resigned him. Like, there's no reason why they didn't and for it was good for him to be able to get in there and just in your face yeah if james vodders and they said it on the broadcast got hurt earlier lemon probably would have been back in calgary i don't know if he would have said no (laughs) i'm not sure but uh yeah he had two sacks in this one as well that takes him to 99 in his career and i don't have a doubt i think he's gonna get to 100 before the end of the year but i I think one of the defining moments here was that near the end of the first quarter micah alway took a spearing penalty on school cole speaker 25 yards man it not only looked unnecessary it looked dangerous it's tough that's the stuff we need out of football man and man that looked painful i don't know how speaker gets up from that but yeah helmet to helmet leading with the crown of your helmet th- that was just unnecessary on always part yeah and it's not like it's the first time it's happened it's uh he has a reputation now and you know 10 years ago it was Kyrie Z bear who had that reputation yeah. and it seems that mike always unfortunately getting there too so he, either the league needs to do something about it or he his coaches need to do something about it and him himself because i i don't think like he seems like a good player he, yeah. he like it i it just something kind of switches in his head and it's just he plays too aggressive like, and the player is already wrapped say. up like yeah no yeah. it's it's happening everywhere though. You like you see like yeah. not so much with your crown in your head, but like just like just shoulder tackling and like like it's just they, they want to get that sports center highly big hit now yeah, instead yeah. of tackling, instead of just stopping the ball carrier from gaining yards. So it's, well, I think that's why so many of the defenses struggle with uh, stopping the run because they're not <laughs> they're not used to it. Yeah, no, <laughs> and I don't know if that's and. I think it's been talked about before that less contact and practices kind of thing, but the, yeah. none of them were going for the, uh, the way they were taught to tackle. <laughs> no, nowadays it's just like Ralph Wiggum just <laughs> through the, through the glass. Like, like I know that that memes all over the, yeah. the Twitter or X cause of Adam Big Hill, but uh, like it's what they're doing and it's, it's unnecessary. And as a former coach, like I coached minor football and like, that was five years ago. But even back then, the kids, they just wanted to hit big because yeah. in Madden, there's the truck stick and all yeah. this stuff. And you, but you have to form tackle. You have to wrap up. You have to keep your face mask up so you can see what you're hitting, not using your helmet as a weapon. Now, the the drive where Micah Alway took the penalty, uh, it ended in a touchdown for the Alouettes. So the Alouettes made him pay for that 25 yards in field position. Uh, Caleb yeah. Evans running the ball into the end zone behind Almondo Sewell. When he's on the right side of the line, you know which way they're going to run. <laughs> and Calgary had no answer for that multiple yeah. times in this game. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what you're going to do. Uh, Calgary did tie the game up with the Reggie Bagleton touchdown left in the first half. Montreal helping Calgary with the penalties of their own as well, taking that roughing the passer call. Uh, Calgary converted actually a second and 16 at one point in that drive. Jake Mayer making a beautiful throw here, but the... 
still some very tough moments for Jake Mayer in this one. It was 11-8 Montreal at halftime. And I think one of the big things for the Alouettes here was the way that they were using William Stanback. He had 14 carries, 81 yards, a very respectable night, almost six yards a carry for him. I think that was big. He even had four catches, 19 yards, including receiving touchdown. It was just big that they were actually using Stanback in this one. Yeah, and surprise, surprise, it worked. Like, hopefully for their for their sake that uh, Jason Moss continues to use him because this is the time of the year when you want to have yeah. your ground game ready to go for the playoffs when it's cold out there, right? So, I think Montreal is like they're not they're not as good of a team as Toronto, but they're they're on the uptrend and like if they can get Standback going and if Cody can stay healthy and on defense with it, like getting Sankey in there and, and lemon, like Montreal could do some noise in the East in the playoffs there. They just seem to be the team that is the litmus test in the CFL. Yeah. They haven't lost to anybody below 500 and they haven't beat anybody above 500. They, they've <laughs> lost four in a row, but yeah. I think the teams that have beat them four in a row, they had a combined record of 34 and eight or something yeah. like that. So they're getting beat by good teams and they're, they're beating the bad teams here. Uh, yeah. Calgary did have opportunities to win this game. Cody threw an interception early in the uh, second half. The Canadian, Nick Stats, with the INT for the Stampeders. But then third and three from the Alouettes four. 634 left in the third quarter, and Jake Mayer gets picked off in the end zone by Mark antoine de Croix. Those interceptions in the end zone that end in no points. That's a dagger to your team. Seems to happen in Calgary quite quite it a bit. Does. Statistically. It does. Happened in overtime earlier this yeah. year. Like yeah, and and like in the Grey Cup against Ottawa. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, yeah. So uh, I don't know. Like you, if you're on the four yard line, you'd think you'd be able to get in there, but it's it just shortens the field and it, and the advantage like it goes to the defense because the offense can't run around as much right so mm -hmm. it's it's very interesting how that dynamic works where when you're deep in your own you got you can do whatever you want but then as you get closer it just gets harder and harder to score which is why we watch the game i guess now we talk about teams making teams pay for their mistakes and making turnovers normally you get good field position out of a turnover not the best field mm -hmm. position when uh, you, you you pick them off in the end zone, but you get that momentum, right? Mm -hmm. And the very next drive, Cody Fajardo hits Tyson Philpot, 51 yards. He gets taken down at the one. Philpot, former UFC Dino, wanted to score the touchdown at McMahon Stadium, but couldn't quite get in. Uh, Caleb Evans yeah. gets another touchdown, and uh, that's when it kind of ended for the uh, Stampeders. That was uh, Amando Sewell again uh, blocking on the right side of that offensive line. That might be Montreal's secret weapon down the stretch. Yeah. yeah. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Keep rolling with it. And I guess we got to talk about <laughs> David Cote with a kickoff going through the uprights. <laughs> That, I guess that shows you how but, the wind was that day. But hits the uprights so they don't get the rouge. So if it goes through, does it have to go through? Because on kickoffs, normally I thought the returner had to touch the ball to get yeah, up the single. Um, but if it goes yeah, you through the right. uprights, does it count? I'm not sure. No, I, I don't think the uprights have anything to do with it. You're right. I think it, on a kickoff, oh, okay. it does have to be. Yeah, so it wouldn't have been a rouge anyway. But. Either way. Still cool. Well, like you see should. it every yeah. It, if you yeah. get it through the uprights, oh, you should get kickoff. four points on a kickoff. <laughs> I think hell yeah, absolutely. Like That's it happens impressive. in the NFL every other game because yeah, yeah, you know their kicking is terrible. But um, yeah, I, I, that would be a great rule change. You know, four <laughs> points on a kickoff if you if you kick a field goal. I'm here for it, Randy. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> Calgary comes back with a field goal. Montreal leads. 18-11 with 13.40 to go. And then here comes badly timed penalties from the Stampeders. Calgary stopped Montreal in a second and seven. Took an illegal contact. 
Montreal drive extends. They get a field goal out of it. Now they're up by 10. And I don't know if you saw Ben Major, he got punched? Or did he? Did his arm get hit so he punched himself? <laughs> I, I, he I was didn't fired see up. Enough. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't see enough to comment, but I heard. I heard he was quite fired up. Yeah, yeah. So there was a penalty on that. I think it only get yeah. called a uh, misconduct there. But then yeah. Luther Hawk and Avanu takes a, an offensive pass interference, which I thought was pretty lame. Yeah. Tbh. That's how <laughs> the kids talk. Uh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Tbh. <laughs> Showing your age there, AF. <laughs> With 222 left in the game. William Stanback gets that touchdown, and the Owls lead 28 11. So here we are. For the first time in 17 years, the Calgary Stampeders could miss the playoffs. Look at that happy dance from Sheldon Jones. Been waiting so long. <laughs> it's glorious glorious wow uh i now like really i i really thought that this is a winnable game from the stamps and it was there were some costly mistakes costly penalties yeah. but montreal took advantage of every single one of them and they got the darn win a, a tough win traveling across the country into calgary to get it and credit to them for getting it and uh I think it's never happened in the modern CFL. Both Alberta teams missing the playoffs. But here we are. It does and look Cal like it's going to happen. Well, and Calgary was coming off the bye too, weren't they? Yes. Like, so they arrested. Montreal fl try flies all the way over to Calgary and puts a hurting on them. I, wow. I'm wondering if this is... Oh, it has to do with Dave taking over the, the GM as well, because maybe he's not having enough time to spend with the team coaching while he's work, worrying about the scouting and he's worrying about contracts and all that other stuff. So it's interesting. Like, I know the GM head coach combo is is kind of becoming almost the norm for half of the teams now, but is that taking away from what he's doing? Because Calgary teams were very disciplined. They were very good. They, I, I just, I don't know what's going on in Calgary, but I'm here for it, and hopefully it continues to happen. <laughs> Making your feelings known. I love it. Uh, <laughs> week 16 ended, and I don't know what I was thinking, that the Ticats could cover this nine-and-a-half-point spread. Uh, <laughs> with Andrew Harris going on the sixth game, A.J. Olette's, uh, being rested as the Argos have first locked up. It just looked like it was easy for the Argos beating the Thai Cats 29 14. It, like they, they bring in Deontay McMahon, who, who got into the lineup last week. He had a couple carries. He's running wild all over the Thai Cats. So clearly they have uh, some depth there. Now, he only had 12 carries for 43 yards, but once they get him 26 yards receiving as well, uh, this guy looks explosive here. He had mm -hmm. two carries over 10 yards, so he looks like he can make plays out there. The, the Ticats just, they, oh, <laughs> they couldn't get it done. I really thought they could. I really thought they had momentum here, but mm -hmm. it was the Argo defense that really shut him down in this one. There was a pick six from Winton McManus, and uh, maybe he's in the most outstanding defensive player discussion out of the East. He actually had another interception in this one, tackled inside the five. He almost put, well, and essentially put 12 points on the board for the Argos because that other drive obviously ended in a touchdown. But Winton McManus is all over the place in this one. Yeah, yeah. Um... I think it just kind of seems like Hamilton got like kind of knocked back into reality. Like yeah. they, they knocked off BC, they knocked off Winnipeg. And then maybe same thing as what's happening with the Rough Riders. They just kind of thought they were better than they are now. And and there was, like you said, the recipe was there for them to beat the Argos with all, all the people that were missing and just couldn't do it. And so now Toronto's beat them four times in this season. And that's, 
<laughs> I would need Rob Vanstone to tell us the last time a team beat another team at four times in a season. Like that's that's sad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like if you're like if you're a Hamilton Tie Cafe and you lose to your rival four times in a season, whew, that man. hurts. That yeah. hurts. Early in the game, uh, Javon Leak fumbled a punt when it was ten nothing. Uh, Argos. So the Thai Cats took over with good field position, but they settled for a field goal. And then the next drive, the next possession for the Argos, play action. Chad Kelly hits Dijon Brissett for a 70 yard touchdown, made it look easy. 16 3 Argos after they missed the point after, and that's with just over three minutes to go in the force first. So the Argos mm-hmm. started fast and they meant business. Yeah, like again, Chad Kelly is proving that he's he's at that Zach Caleros level where you know if he needs to, he can just change a game in one series, like just answer. Yeah. And it's <laughs> It's awesome. It's awesome for the league. It's awesome for that market. Uh, the, the they're getting fans. People are still, you know, trying. Oh, you're not going to get twenty thousand. Shut up. Like they'll get that brought... for the playoff East final. Yeah, uh, no doubt about it. Yeah, and it's they're winning. That's what you need to do in Toronto. You win. You you get some promotions going, and and they have a marketable star quarterback, and that's what they need and he wants to be in Toronto he's already signed a long-term deal so I think the fan base in Toronto is gonna be rewarded with Chad Kelly for the for the next however long he wants to play well and I saw a few number 12 jerseys in the stands at BMO so that is such good news here there there were over 15,000 in the stands in Toronto and man you can slag on that all you want fact is that's an improvement over the past uh, few years for the Argos. And it does look like they've got a great atmosphere uh, for football there. And we we talk about Taylor Powell. He only got sacked twice in this one. But otherwise, it just seemed like there was no time for him. The Ticats offensive line was really just getting torched. <laughs> yeah. There was there was nothing for him to do in this one. The the Argos front was was all over the young quarterback. Let's look at James Butler, 13 carries, 32 yards, two and a half yards a carry against the Argos. The the defense came out fired up. So credit to Dinwiddie, credit to the whole organization for and maybe they have that record in sight, the best CFL regular season of all time. Now, they do play the Bombers this week. If they beat the Bombers, it's in play, man. After that, they've got Ottawa, they've got Edmonton, and they've got Saskatchewan. <laughs> if they win all these games, yeah, 17-1 and one is in play. They actually play Ottawa the last week of the regular season as well. Now, teams will tell you that they don't play for records. They, they don't do any of that. But I think that's a load of crap. <laughs> well, I think it is. But at, the, but at the same time, we need to – or the players need to realize that those records are great. But – Ask the Dolphins what it's like to have a, a perfect season, right? So ask uh, ask Tom Brady. Sixteen what it's and two like. Edmonton team that yeah. lost to the nine and nine Riders in the West Final. Yeah, yeah. So it, but it's, but you know, those those record like records are made to be broken. So someday somebody will break that record, and so far Toronto de- like has seemed like they deserve to be the team to do it this year. So. We'll see what happens, uh, but they're gonna they're gonna be rotating. I think the players that they're sitting for these next four games because yeah. because yeah. they had their they due to the wonderful CFL schedule they had their bye weeks out of the way quite early yeah. and yeah. they do get that bye to the for the first round so at least they do have one bye week left but they're gonna be they're gonna be sore they're gonna be hurting so they're gonna need to to sit some players down but they have to be careful because they can't i don't think you sit a player twice in a week twice in a row maybe get them a half here take them out at half but but 
this team is is good enough to you know score 30 points in the first half and then put their backups in and still win the game so we'll see what happens toronto had four penalties in this one for 38 yards the cats had nine of them but a lot of these are preventable stuff offside procedure five yards here and there can just make it so much tougher on your offense and so much t- easier on the opposing offense if you're oh, yeah. <laughs> giving up silly penalties uh, like that. So th- there was just the emotion was gone from the Thai Cats, kind of like I feel like for the Riders. Yeah. Uh, it just wasn't there in this one. They even tried a flea flicker in the third quarter. That one picked off by Winton McManus. It was just nothing uh, was going right for the Thai Cats. There was one thing going right for the Cats, which uh, we'll give a shout out to him right away. Uh, and thank you, Terry Godwin, for getting a touchdown because he put me over 100 points <laughs> in my uh, fantasy week. Uh, and Winton McManus did help that drive a little bit with a horse collar penalty. It wasn't like a malicious one. <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> uh, he realized it, let go kind of thing. Um. 27-11 with uh, 9.52 left in the fourth quarter. And then Taylor Powell gets called for intentional grounding in the end zone. So it ends up being a safety there. And uh, it's just not much went right for the Ticats. Even Omar Bayless, the the hurdle gets called back because of a holding call. Like, uh, it was just uh, nothing. Nothing went right. Uh, for <laughs> for the Argos, I do, or the Ticats. I want to mention the end of the fourth quarter. What did you think about that? Chad Kelly gets tackled from behind. He gets kind of slapped on the helmet. Dinwiddie challenges the roughing the passer. It doesn't get called. Chad Kelly mouths into the camera. Player safety. Well, so... I'm kind of torn because, you know, a little slap on the head isn't going to necessarily injure somebody. But at the same time, the re- the booth review has called that penalty. They have. You're right. So it's not, well, Chad Kelly's mouthing player safety. It is player safety, but it's actually just officiating consistency or booth consistency. Because if the letter of the law says any contact to a helmet yeah. on a quarterback, then a slap to the helmet is a contact and you have to call it. <laughs> so I get his frustration. You've seen Zach frustrated earlier in the mm-hmm. year a lot. Um, so that's, that's something that they need to look at. And and I get that on the field, these refs, they're part-time employees, they're doing their best. So calls can get missed on the field. That's fine. But you need to be able to make it right in the booth. And I know a lot of people are like, oh, it's Al Bradbury in the booth. So you never know what's going to happen. But like, you need to have somebody in that booth who's consistent and who's going to make the right call. And if, if Al Bradbury's not doing it, then get rid of him and get somebody else in there. Like have somebody this whole off season training, watching film. Is this a hit? Is this a hit? Is this a hit? Is this a hit? And figure it out so that it's down the, it's straight down the middle, penalty, non penalty. Otherwise, you're just going to have fans bitching all the time that their team has, there's a conspiracy against them when there isn't. But yeah. all these fan bases and mostly Ryder fans will say that the league's against them and they're not. It's just they don't know what they're doing. That That's plain and simple. Yeah, I think just being consistent is yeah, it's the name of the game here. Yeah, um, Keandre Smith, I think the lone bright spot for the Hamilton Tiger Cats, nine catches on thirteen targets. That actually might be the most in a game this season by any receiver. I'd have to go back and and look, but one hundred and fifty six yards for Keandre Smith. That is the bright spot for the Ticats in this one. He had 101 yards more than the next closest receiver on his own team. Wild game from Keandre Smith. Dejon Brissett had 98 yards on six catches, two scores for him. 
and DeVars Daniels was next with uh, four catches, 64 yards. The Argos, <laughs> they get a win over their rivals. And like you mentioned, that is uh, four in a single season. And the Ticats, if they want to get to the East Final or the Grey Cup in their own stadium, they're going to have to, it's going to go through the Argos no matter which way they look at it. The leading tackler for the Argos was a Darius Pickett who had nine tackles himself. Uh, just a monstrous game. Winton McManus, six uh, tackles in this one. One for a loss, two interceptions, a touchdown. Uh, he has been playing like a beast out there. Robbie Smith got a sack. Thomas Costigan got a sack for the Argos. So their depth was on display in this one and they just beat up their rivals down the QEW. Uh, my fantasy lineup, I ended up getting a win in the uh, CFL Podcast Fantasy League. I beat Joe Pritchard of the uh, Rouge, White and Blue CFL Podcast. Uh, I think the playoffs are starting now, so I'm going to have to up my game a little bit here. I am 56th on the website. I'm looking to move up a little bit. I should have made Reggie Bagleton my captain instead of Jake Mayer. Oh, that would have bought me a lot more points because uh, Reggie Bagleton had 29.9 points in uh, this game. It definitely would have helped my cause uh, trying to make some cash around here. But he had, we want to talk about targets. Man, I said Keandre Smith might have the highest uh, targets in a game, 13. Well, Reggie had 14. Uh, <laughs> 13 catches and a touchdown, 109 yards. So uh, thanks to Reggie Bagleton for being the anchor of my uh, fantasy lineup this week. Terry Godwin had 16.8 points for me. Sean Bain, 4.8 points uh, for the Riders. Jake Mayer, 21.2, but he was my captain. The Stamps defense only got me one. Devontae Williams, 19.3 points. So 101.4 points on the week. Eh, it could have been better if all I had to do is click the captain next to Reggie and things look a lot better. Yeah, I actually beat you this week, which is pretty impressive. You did. Well done. I'm 1,901 in the <laughs> league. So <laughs> some would say that's my birth year, but I'll continue on. Uh <laughs> Yeah, so I also had, you know, Calgary, and I had uh, Reggie Bagleton, so I don't need to talk about that. But my captain is Trey Ford. He got me 38.6 points. That's decent. So that's that's decent, yeah. Kadeem Carey got me 9.2, Butler 8.2, Keon Hatcher 13.1, and, and Austin Mack only 8.1. So, like, nothing really crazy, but Bagleton and Trey Ford definitely helped. But Yeah. We'll see what happens next week. Yes, we are here at week 17 of the CFL season. There's only about a month left before the playoffs get underway. And uh, I've had this one circled on my calendar. We'll see here. The Argos do have first locked up in the East. They might not be. And sometimes you want to see these games, teams put their best foot forward. But we know that's not always the reality here but the argos and the bombers uh start this week the riders and the lions start this week i know who i'm picking in that one uh, <laughs> <laughs> the red blacks and the alouettes i think it's going to be a fascinating matchup in ottawa and the stamps and the tie cats which i think will be another interesting game on saturday well, Sheldon, uh, this week has been a uh, pain in the ass. <laughs> Maybe I am the problem all along in the two and out universe. <laughs> no. But we got her done, buddy. Thanks for being here. Always. You can uh, rate, review, and subscribe to Two and Out on your favorite podcatcher. And uh, hey, subscribe on uh, YouTube as well. I think if we get like a million views, they'll start paying us. So. Uh, uh, everybody just put it on repeat. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Come on. We're hungry. Help us out. <laughs> yeah, we need more super big gulps, man. Uh, <laughs> so thanks for listening to the show. And uh, we'll talk to you on Thursday to get you ready for week 17. Thanks for listening. 
Find more great shows like this at CF Pod Network on Twitter.